uh, to be respectful of everyone's time, why don't we get started? So thank you everybody for joining our presentation today, best practices for selecting inclusive and diverse photos. Um, my name is Michelle Koffel. I work in university communications and um, I'll introduce myself a bit and then the rest of the folks who are presenting can, can talk about them themselves. And then I will kind of take you through our presentation today and you know what to expect and and we'll have some you know follow up for you too. A couple of housekeeping notes. So your microphones are are turned off, you know everybody's muted so we can have a kind of everybody can hear each other. Um, I did want to note that you can put your questions in the chat if you'd like or you know raise your you know use the hand symbol if if you want to ask a question as we're going along. And then there'll be question, time for questions at the end too. So again, thank you for joining us. My name is Michelle Koppel and I've been in university communications for 21 years now. Um, so, and then I will pass it over to Sherelle. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, as Michelle said, I am Sherelle Arnold. I use she, her pronouns. I am the interim director for um, Grand Valley's new, very new program. It's called the Laker Educational Opportunity Center. And um, I have been here at GBSU for um, just over, or just about 18 years. And so I'm excited to come in and share some uh, perspective about inclusive photography. You want me to go, Amanda, or do you want me to, you want to go? I'll go next. How about that? Um, I'm Zach. I work on the web team and in institutional marketing. Um, I'm the web trainer and content specialist. So um, I'm excited to chat with all of you about um, our presentation today. And my role in this is going to be taking what, what we show you and how to apply it in particular to the CMS and to your web pages. So I am looking forward to showing you all that and chatting with all you. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Pitts. I'm the senior photographer uh, in the University Communications Office. I've worked at Grand Valley for 14 years. Um, I also have served on the board of UPAA, which is the University Photographers Association of America, um, as the corporate relations chair for the past several years. Um, UPAA is the organization uh, where the paper originated that parts of this presentation are based off of. So I'll talk more about that in a bit. All right, thank you. So in, in today's workshop, we're gonna talk about why representation and diversity is so important in photos and, and images that you use online or in your e-newsletter, any printed materials. Amanda will go, um, will go through how the UPAA, you know, how they established this paper, how, you know, why the idea came about. Um, we'll talk about authenticity and again, you know, touch on there may be other ways to, to, sh to show diversity, even if you're not using a photo of a person. Um, we'll take you through some action steps for your own workflow that I think you'll find helpful. And then we'll talk, and Zach will talk about wide end searches and, and using alt tag in, your, in the CMS. So, you know, when, when you think about, think about images that you're using in your, you know, in your own departments for your own colleges, photos on, on websites and, and in your materials, they, you know, obviously have to be representative of the university, right? And, and it's so important that, that diverse photos are not overrepresented and not underrepresented, but students need to see themselves in photos, you know, it adds to a sense of belonging. And then of course, um, adds to student success 
as, as they go through their classes. So also you can see other bullet points on the slide. It's, you know, photos and images are really the story behind the statistics of a university. It's another way to showcase, um, you know, who's attending your, who's attending your college, who's attending your university. Um, there's a note here about just always keep in your mind who might be looking at your websites. It's not only current students, faculty and staff, you know, our campus community, but it's also parents and prospective students, uh, um, general public, you know, a lot of eyes go on the materials that you are responsible for. And again, a note on, on you know, please keep in mind that what we, when we talk about websites also holds true for any e-newsletters that you're sending out, um, any printed materials, social media, any other publications you have. And I think, you know, we'll also, we'll also talk about the dangers of engineering, you know, so to speak, engineering a photo. Um, and, and in a sense, that would be like, oh, I need, you know, I need an Asian student and an African American student and a Latino student in this photo for my department. Make that happen. You know, so, so there's, um, it, it's a sensitive subject and I really appreciate um, everybody's attention and, and I hope you find this valuable. Thank you. So the UPAA paper, I'd like to just share a bit of background here. Um, some of what we're presenting to you today is based off this best practices for inclusive and diverse photography in higher education paper. Um, how the paper came to life goes a little like this. Uh, a UPAA member came to the organization's board and said that there was a real need for some kind of official best practices document to help guide photographers and their institutions um, with regards to inclusive and diverse photography. Um, he cited some specific instances that were happening within his own school that he felt uncomfortable with and thought having a guiding resource to show administrators and departments that he worked with might help with similar situations going forward. Um, when he brought this to the board, we all agreed this was a great idea. Um, university photographers are often on the front lines of creating inclusive and diverse photography, but we're often told how to do so or we're guided to create things in a way that is uncomfortable to us and can also feel uncomfortable to the students being photographed. Um, this topic had come up time and time again at our past conferences, um, and we really felt like it was time to seriously address it in a professional manner. So um, the first thing that we did was we chose a committee of members um, to help develop and write this paper. Um, I was one of the lucky ones chosen. Um, and so our committee started meeting regularly and we came up with five questions, um, which we then sent along to DEI professionals at various institutions. Um, several professionals here at Grand Valley weighed in on the questions, including Sherelle, who you'll hear from more in a few minutes. Um, we then looked at the answers to those questions and found common threads within the answers and formed the paper from that. Along the way, we checked in with um, the DEI professionals through the whole process from the question formation to the paper outline to the finished paper. Um, the paper has now been presented multiple times at professional organization events, including NCMPR, CASE, um, and at individual institutions like we're doing right now. Um, this paper was meant as a starting point, something to help open a dialogue at our own institutions and beyond. It doesn't touch on every single thing. Um, and we've had requests for like paper part two in the future to address um, how to be even more inclusive. We've had requests to include things about more diversity of body size and shape, um, hair color, you know, different looks like the popular bright hair trends, um, tattoos, piercings, things like that, that are a little out of the um, norm of what used to be portrayed <clears throat> um, in official like marketing materials and stuff like that. So as I said, this paper was a starting point um, and there's always more to talk about. Thanks. So um, thanks, Amanda. So everyone, again, my name is Sherelle Arnold. During the time that Amanda and her team first came up with this, at that time, 
I was situated um, in another division, which is an inclusion and equity, serving as the associate director for the Center for Women and Gender Equity. At that time, she approached me as a DEI professional. Now, I want to just put out a disclaimer. That is a title applied by the university. It does not mean that I am um, at the end of my learning. It does not mean that I'm not still growing and that I have all of the answers. I am one Black woman who has experienced life through my own lived experiences, you know, my lens. So I cannot speak to um, anything that's wider than that. This is just from my you know, personal perspective. And the questions that um, Amanda began to ask me allowed for she and I to have a pretty candid conversation um, in which I shared some experiences with being myself photographed as someone who is racially ambiguous. I do not identify as multiracial, um, mom and dad, both Black, African-American. Um, I just have very, very fair skin. And um, most occasions, my hair is pretty straight. And um, it, today, it's in a braided bun. So, you know, a little different. But so I think that, you know, when this resonated with me, when she began to ask some of these questions, and I leaned into the conversation because I felt as a professional representing division, um, diversity and equity work, that this was an opportunity for me to give voice to some people that are chronically muted and possibly excluded from pictures. So um, today's presentation is, is definitely not about us giving you all one fail-proof answer, but it's more so for us to engage you in and to prompt conversation to give you um, some things to consider. So when we're looking at um, photos, and Michelle alluded to this, this idea of engineering opportunities, we want natural and authentic representation, but we understand that as professionals that are in this work, that you all that are trying to document things, that you're trying to create imagery or so, that there is going to be some extra work on your end if you truly want to do it in a very um, intentional way. Having natural and authentic representation is challenging, specifically when we're talking about minoritized populations in the context of a predominantly white institution. If you show too many of people of color, and again, I'm just gonna speak to black folks, so if I, as a prospective staff member, if I see a flyer and every other person is black on that flyer, then I'm thinking, wow, there's a lot of folks that look like me. There's community for me. Um, but that's also misleading because we know that that's not the true picture, for example, at our institution. Grand Valley is predominantly white. And that is OK. There's nothing wrong with that. However, if you do, if you have so if you have too many in the photographs, it's misleading. If you don't have enough, then I look at it again as a potential staff member coming in and it could be, um, it's less affirming and it, it is less inviting for me. And so that's where I say the extra work comes in on the part of those that are trying to create images. And we know that images, you know, they, this, the saying goes, pictures speak a thousand words, right? We know that images really, really can be powerful, they can do two things. They can either uphold stereotypes in a very dynamic way, or they can do something really powerful and, and impactful and deconstruct myths and, and, and false notions. Does that, I hope that makes sense with people. I'm an early educator at, at heart, so I feel like I'm looking at the screens, looking for people to affirm me and say, yes, that makes sense, or I'm confused or raise a hand. So, um, But we want to make sure that those are the things that we um, are, are doing when we're going about a wide representation of students. Because as Michelle said, when someone is perusing the Grand Valley website, they are looking for places and spaces where they can see themselves, where they can see um, how they fit in, so to speak. So this is where um, Amanda and I had some really, really, sorry, it's loud. We had some great conversations about stereotypes. And so I had told her how disappointed I was with a photograph of a Black male student in a football uniform. And I thought, man, 
what a missed opportunity for the institution to, um, to allow this African-American student, this black man to be pictured in another form, right? Um, and so I said to Amanda, it's, it's terrible that we have to kind of play with this. And there's this tension between the two because do black football players exist at Grand Valley? Absolutely, we do, we have tons of them. So it's not false representation. However, when that is the only representation, you miss out on um, the complex nature of the individual. Could that same young man, could he be a science major, right? Or chemistry major? Could he have been captured with his lab coat on or with some goggles on or are doing um, some investigation, some scientific investigation? How powerful would that be? It puts him outside of a notion that we already know exists. We all come into life and we all have experiences. We all have bias. And can I get a show of thumbs that we all, does everybody agree that we all have bias, right? If you don't agree with that, I would encourage you to maybe um, consider another i &E, um, Sprout presentation and to look at unconscious bias. And um, if you don't even understand how those, how unconscious bias and the context, I'm sorry, and the connection between photographs, there's, again, we won't go into that, but there's an opportunity to engage in some learning there with inclusion and equity to talk about, um, to talk about that. We, we know photos and the, the images there are either going to, like I said, uphold a stereotype. And so it's not a stereotype that the Black student is a football player because that is his true identity. However, it minimizes and it doesn't allow us to see the full complex nature of this individual that he's also, you know, maybe we could have pictured a Black male student um, golfer, right? Because that is not, this, that narrative is not as widely seen, captured, promoted as much as football. Does that make sense to everybody? I hope so. And so um, that is where we began to have some really good conversation. And further, you know, I said that we were looking at a woman who's a scientist. And, um, and I think that maybe someone, um, a woman in a, excuse me, we want, we're looking at an Indian woman, a woman who identifies as Indian, looking at her in a science class. And so we, I felt like that image was captured more often. And so could we maybe put her in a different light so that we can show people how complex we are, that there's something wider to us? You can go to the next one. Um, some identities cannot be picked, right? You cannot just have a box, um, a checklist and say, we need someone who's black. We need someone who's gay. We need someone who's Muslim. There are identities that you cannot see, that cannot be captured, that they're not going to be um, shared unless they are disclosed by that individual. So if you're ever trying to say to yourself, hey, I want this photo to be as inclusive as possible, so let me go down a list, it's inevitable. You're going to miss someone. So that's probably the worst idea ever is to try to go by a list, but also understanding you're making an assumption. When we look at these two pictures here, if we are going based on skin complexion, then we might say, oh, this person um, is white. We don't know what that person's identity is. And so it's not the best idea to go off of um, representation based on skin color. So. And I think that's my, um, so avoid the checklist and don't assume, sorry. Okay. <laughs> So I've got some action steps here um, to help you um, not just with being, you know, inclusive with photography, but kind of just in general um, to help with your CMS and keep, you know, keeping up your websites and publications. Um, so it's important to continually update and refresh your photography on your websites and in your publications. Um, use photography from only the last few years 
um, you know, students, they, they graduate and then you might have a student from years ago still on your, on your website. Um, so having a variety of, of things that are more current is, is important. And then work directly with whomever you're making or maintaining the website or publications for to identify upcoming events and opportunities relevant to your area for capturing images of a variety of students. That really helps with the, the authenticity factor um, then you're making sure that you're capturing students and events that are actually happening um, to represent on, you know, them on your website and in publications. Um, and then if you, if you are not capturing the photography yourself, um, if you need photography for your department website or publications, please consider contacting the universities at, or sorry, the photographers at um, University Communications. Uh, we charge $65 an hour for event coverage, and we can also quote you a price for photography projects that are not events. Um, we've worked with departments before to create things for their websites that are not event based. We can do portraiture or um, like all kinds of different things. So feel free to contact us. Um, you can look at the services we offer at that, that link there um, that you can check out later. And then make sure that you check out the photos on Widen, which is the Green Valley Online Photo Database for photos that you can use. That's where the um, university communications photographers upload a ton of our, um, our images there. And they're for, they're for you to use for your stuff. So check that out. Um, and Zach will demo Widen for you in, in a little bit, so. Um, you can move on to the next slide there. So another really important thing is to use photos within the context that they were originally intended. Um, one way to make sure you're doing that is to check the, the file information on the photo. Many professional photographers add keywords and captions to photos along with other information. Uh, most photos that you'll find in Widen will have keywords, a caption, or both check the keywords and caption information to see what the photo is about and see where it came from. And once you know more about the photo and the people portrayed in it, think about if that fits your usage or if you should continue looking for something else that more closely aligns with your needs. Um, this slide gives directions for how to find file information using Finder on a Mac, using Adobe Lightroom or Adobe Bridge. Uh, there will be more detailed screenshots you can look at when we send you follow-up information. You can also check file info and widen, which Zach will show in a little bit. And then um, a couple other points to mention that aren't included on, on these slides is to be conscientious of how you're portraying people. Uh, in particular, print publications can be tricky. Files that are too small for print or printed poorly can misrepresent a person. The photos in printed publications can show up not sharp or render untrue skin tone colors if files aren't the right size or aren't calibrated correctly. Um, and skin tones should never be altered to appear brighter or darker online or in print. Um, if you need assistance or another pair of eyes on publications, Michelle is happy to help you with that. And the photographers in UCOM are always happy to lend opinions on photography. And then one last thought for me, um, I know this isn't always possible, but it's ideal to involve the person who is being photographically represented in the process. Um, if you can show them the photo and how it will be used, see if they have any reservations about how they're being portrayed. So that's it for me. And now on to Zach. Amanda, sorry, I was going to ask, oh, yeah. say something with that. And that yeah. speaks to that, to the audience that speaks to that monolith idea that because Amanda consults with me as one black woman and how I want to be represented, you can't use that as a blanket for assuming the next black woman, that's how she also wants to be represented. Because if I have maybe, um, I think we ex used the example of a birthmark, maybe on my photo, maybe that's important to me and I want my birthmark um, seen visibly un, untouched in my photo, but then someone else might say, no, I feel a little more, maybe I'm insecure about it. Or it has something else to it. I want you to doctor that up. So that's why that asking that permission to allow the person to have choice and have voice and how they and their likeness is represented. Mm. 
Okay. I am next. So taking all these wonderful things that we have all said about photography and how to use images, I'm going to show you some real life application and how we can use um, what we've talked about in, in particular into the CMS. And so the first thing is using widen. Um, I'm going to, in the next slide, you'll see me actually log into widen and I will show you um, some very basic search. But uh, I also wanted to mention that I've created a tutorial page on how to use Widen and it's available. And again, um, if you haven't seen the chat messages after this class, we will have, um, we will send out a link that will have um, a page that will have everything that we've talked about and including this page here. And so if I just, I'll show you real quick what this page looks like. Oops. Um, and it's basically a walks you right through how to use widen and how to log in and any questions you may have. So um, just know that that is coming up here in just a few seconds. So a few other tips that I, that I want to mention, um, first of all, is use real GVSU images, um, which kind of goes with the next few tips as well which is avoiding stock photos and avoiding um, Googling photos. So one of the biggest no-nos you can do in terms of the CMS and what you um, can do with it is Googling photos and trying to find a picture on Google to upload to your CMS. Um, excuse me, there, we, there, are in, there have been instances at Grand Valley where a person has gone to Google, found a picture, downloaded that picture and uploaded that image up to their CMS and they have been fined and have had to had had to pay a dollar amount in because they have used a photo that they did not have permission to use and so the example I always give is let's just say for example you're going to have or your department's going to have a uh, a picnic and so they say, hey, Zach, can you create a page for us on the institutional marketing page um, telling everyone about this picnic we're going to have? And so what I could do, which is wrong, is I could go to Google. I could type in picnic basket. I find a cute, adorable picture of a picnic basket. I download it and I then use that photo on my web page for this picnic that we're going to have. And so um, unless you have permission to use that photo, um, what you're doing is prohibited. And so that is why you always want to avoid Googling photos to find one. There are options out there for free photos. There are websites such as the Creative Commons that allow you and give you access to photos that are copyright free. Um, I always say use that with your discretion because even though it's on a copy, it's on a web page, it says it's copyright free, doesn't mean it may in fact be copyright free. What I mean by that is, let's just say, for example, I take a picture that Amanda takes and I then upload it to the Creative Commons. If somebody else then looks at it and says, oh, well, that photo's free because it's on the Creative Commons, that's not necessarily always the case. So always use discretion when you are using a free photo. And if you are using a free photo, you will always want to give them credit. And so as an example, if I go back a couple of slides here, um, you'll see that with these pictures, we credited who took the picture and where it was at. So just make sure you always give the proper credit to um, the person who takes the photo. And then the last thing I just want to mention real quick before um, we get to uh, the actual presentation it's or the uh, how to use widen itself is um, when you sign into the CMS for the first time you uh, as a user you accept this user agreement and there is a section in here about using original content so not stealing images and so just as a reminder that ugly no-no of hey you agreed to this you just know that it is in writing there that if you're if you do have a question, the CMS user agreement may have the uh, the answer for you there as well. Um, so next is here is how to use widen. So um, again, I've shown you the the web page that has the demonstration of it and how to use it. So I'm going to walk through how to log in and all that. So 
when you first come to the page here, um, you will log in using your email address and your password. If you've never logged in before, you will need to create an account. Um, just know that when you create an account, the turnaround for creating an account is pretty quick, but it is not instant. So you won't be able to create an account and log in right away. There is a little bit of a delay. Um, I already have an account, so I will sign in. And this is what the main page or the home page of Widen looks like. And so you can see we've got, there's a bunch of different categories and searches over here. The latest activity is over on the right hand side. And then there's also buttons here for different categories, collections, et cetera, underneath activities and such. So my advice um, when you're using Widen would be to do searches. And the searches are going to find you the, the most accurate uh, pictures. And so, for example, let's say on, I, on my web page, I want to put a photo up there of a classroom um, at Grand Valley. And so I typed up here the word classroom, and I hit the search button, and you will see that now I have 3,058 photos that I can use on the CMS um, with where the word classroom is the description of the photo. And so, as you see, I'll just scroll through here and you can see, you know, we've got lots and lots of different options to use. By default, these photos, when you do a search for them, they are sorted by the date that's added. So you're automatically going to see the newest photos first. You can change that if you want to and sort it however you wish. Um, and then you can also jump to, you know, the different pages of the photos as well. And so let's just say, for example, that we look at this photo here, and this is a photo that we want to use on our page. And again, all of these instructions that, I've, that I'm going to be showing you are on the Widen tutorial page that I have. And so... Um, just as just a reminder of you don't need to take the notes on this it will I'm there's a page that will show you how to use this and so with this particular photo I clicked on it and you can see all of the metadata that Amanda had mentioned previously so you can see all the keywords are listed here um, a description of the key of the photo um, etc so lots of information with on the page itself um, if I want to use this for my CMS, what I can do is I can click on this button here that says download and I'm given a bunch of different options. And so um, if you're wanting to use this photo perhaps as the header to your CMS, there is an option for that as well. Otherwise there's um, a bunch of different selections as well, as well here. So for this particular one, I'm going to choose JPEG. You can see if I highlight over the question mark, it will um, tell me how large the photo is. So there's a high resolution option here. This would be more applicable for something you're doing in print, such as a newspaper or magazine, whereas the JPEG small, which I have selected here, is more suitable for web. So if I click on that and I click on download, it will then take me to another screen here in which I will have the option to download it. And you can see it gives you a little prompt that says, hey, this may take a second to download and that's totally fine. Um, this, and again, this is for just downloading one picture in particular. Um, there is the option to, if I'm gonna close this and go back um, to our searches, there is the ability to highlight multiple photos. And as you um, highlight the photos, there's a button up here that you can click on that will allow you to download all of the photos at once. So it is something you don't have to do one photo for each um, download. You can download multiple images at the same time. So I hope that makes sense. And again, if you do feel lost or if you have any questions about this, just know that a lot of the uh, questions that you may have are problem. They may be answered on um, the tutorial page that I've created. Um, I also see we've got a couple questions in the chat as well. I just want to let you know if we don't get around to answering those, um, we will answer those in uh, following up uh, the meeting as well to, um, to make sure we answer all of your questions. So, um, so we will make sure we get all your questions answered. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is using alt text. Um, and 
if you're unfamiliar with alt text, the alt text is the description of a photo um, on a web page so that a person um, who has a difficulty seeing the screen, a screen reader will read to them what the alt text is. And so the alt text is, is a description of the photo. Um, there is a link here for the overview of the alt text standards, which again will be provided at the um, end of class that you can look at. Um, the key word or the key thing with alt text is uh, expressing an emotion, especially an accomplishment. And so if you look at this photo over here on the right hand side, um, the, the photo, an example alt text would be a student proudly holding diploma above her head after graduating from Grand Valley. And when I look at that, the, the key word that sticks out to me is the word proudly. And so because, because you want to be able to convey that emotion that the person is having in the photo. And so how do you do that? you do that using alt text. And so the, um, yeah, so make sure that you express an emotion. The one thing, or another thing that you want to avoid doing is duplicating alt text. And so what I mean by that is if you have, for example, the, let's say we're putting up pictures of our, um, of our uh, picnic, um, say you're putting up and you've got five different pictures listed of the picnic, you will do not want to put, um, photo of picnic one, photo of picnic two, or photo of picnic three, or just photo of picnic over and over and over. To the person who relies on the screen reader, they are just going to hear photo of picnic, photo of picnic, photo of picnic, and they're not going to know at all what's going on in those photos. So it's super important to make sure that you avoid using duplicated alt text, but you also want to make sure that in within the alt text, you're also expressing an emotion that is clear. The analogy I use for alt text within the CMS is that it's almost like the three little or Goldilocks where you want to make sure that you have just the right amount of alt text. So you don't want too little, you don't want too much, you want just the right amount. And so it is a learning curve. There's definitely a balance of learning how to do that. But you just want to make sure that you're not providing too much detail that could be distracting for the person using the screen reader, but also too little detail to the person using the screener has no idea what's what you're talking about. So, um, so just remember Goldilocks and the three bears when you're trying to use the alt text of not using too much, not losing too little, but just enough. Um, and again, all of these links and everything that I, that I have shown you will be provided at the end of class. And so uh, we will send that email out afterwards and uh, you'll be able to see all of the links and resources that I've mentioned. Um, Zach, before you move away, can, before you move away from that slide, maybe we could have a discussion about alt text in terms of identifying, you know, pe people in the photo. And, it, you know, it's, it's, there's, it's difficult, right? Because you don't know if this, student who's holding a diploma, does she, you know, does she identify as a woman? Does she identify as a white woman? Um, generally, when I'm using alt text, I will be vague, ju just like Zach da did and put like, you know, student proudly holding diploma. And, and I hope that it would come within the context of the entire page. You know, if this is a a general story about commencement or, you know, the commencement web page and its, its um, details about times and, and dates and such. But in, if I'm writing a story for GV Next um, and, and I'm, the story is about Black Student Union and there's a photo of, you know, 10 people standing outside who have come from a Black Student Union event, I will say, you know, students standing outside, and this is my alt text, students standing outside um, following a, a Black Student Union event or something. And, you know, that would be, remember, it's accompanying the article or whatever else is on the web page, hopefully giving people with, um, who have visual impairments, the entire scope of what you're trying to convey. Yeah, and I would just add on to that, that with the alt text, it's important to, um, not assume. That's right. the big thing is not to assume um, a, the, 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 the content of the photo 
and also to, um, because you don't know how a person will identifies, but then also to avoid staying clear of labeling. That's um, also important to do as well. So um, yeah. And so, yeah, your example with the student holding, you know, that is very applicable to this, but yeah. So to remove the assumption and also to stay clear of the labeling as well. As well as I would suggest to asking if there's opportunities when you are doing the photograph, asking someone during that time what their pronouns are, how, you know, if, if for the purposes of alt text, if that came up either organically or if you were able to ask, but so that when you're adding that alt text, you know that. And then asking yourself too, is that necessary to give, is that information necessary to give the full scope of the picture? Asking this person that's holding the diploma um, from what I see, I think I can almost maybe see a person of color in the corner, but the three or four folks that faces that I see, I believe they look like they possibly are not people of color, but I don't know that that the, the race part, I don't know that it matters in this particular picture as much as it does in Michelle's example. So then toggling between when is it important when is it useful to, to, to undergird the, 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 the storytelling and to support this, you know, the message versus it, when is it just, you know, additional information? So gender, using gender neutral pronouns, that's something that we can definitely all, all get better practice with, but that's a perfect place to use them. I spelled perfect wrong, I fixed it, but that's a perfect place to apply the use of gender neutral pronouns. Yeah. Um, Michelle, do you want to wrap this up or I get, no, I can, I guess I can. Um, the, yeah. uh, and I don't know if this is a, a good time. Um, we do have some time for other questions too, before, sure. you know, before you go into what people will receive after this presentation. Yeah, sure. So um, real quick before uh, we head in there, I will just mention again, the uh, after this, you will receive an email follow up. Um, this presentation is being recorded. So I'm going to upload that and that will be available if you wish to um, go back to it or share it with anybody else. Um, you will receive the follow up email. It'll have um, links to the appropriate pages that we've mentioned and contact information for questions. Uh, we will also be sending out an evaluation form um, that will be really important for us to see what worked, what didn't work, what we can improve on, et, et cetera. And so, um, and then again, we, if you do have any questions, comments, concerns, please let us know. Um, hopefully we can, we'll steer you in the right direction just because, you know, you know, we've got different kind of avenues of people within this presentation. And so if you do have a question, let any of us know, we'll be happy to pass you along and help you out however we can. So um, at this time, if there are any questions, I see there's a couple of them in there. I need to take a second to read them. Um, I know Irina's got one here. So let me take a second to read that. And uh, if you have any other ones, please let us know. While Zach is reading that question, I do want to quick insert a, a little something that I forgot to mention. And that has to do with the... Um, it's not alt text as we're talking about that, but the statements that sometimes that the messaging that go that accompanies a picture. So not necessarily alt text. There was a GVSU, um, this is again in-house example on the web page on our on the front screen. And on the front screen, it said, um, see yourself here or find yourself here, something to that nature, but see yourself here. And there's a group of students on the, the picture um, and beautiful background campus picture. That picture was of all white students. And so there was some inter-community dialogue between myself, some other black folks. And we were like, wow. So that, you know, does that suggest that we don't see ourselves, that they don't see us or that we aren't there? Maybe had the language been different, the picture, the picture of the all white students wouldn't have resonated in such a way or wouldn't have been felt or received a certain way, but to have a picture that says, see yourself here 
And this is to welcome everybody coming to GVSU. And there was the absence of anyone that was a person of color. It, it did not feel awesome. And when you think about things like imposter, imposter syndrome, when students of color or faculty and staff of color are already struggling with trying to find themselves represented in the context and trying to find a space for them, things like that can be um, further harmful, you know, that could be harmful to a student who's like, well, I'm trying to find myself at GVSU. I want to see myself there. But as their homepage said, suggests, I'm not there. You know, I, so had the language not been accompanying that picture, it maybe have may have felt different. But to have the statement, see yourself here, and there's the absence of anyone that is not white, that sent an unintended message. I don't think the person that put that picture up there was deviously trying to scheme and make someone feel some way. I think it was just something unintentional that just happened to happen. And as a person of color, I immediately saw it and it made me feel some kind of way. Yeah, and um, just to... Uh... Uh, further go on what Irina's question was too, as far as where do you find these photos? I mean, it's such a tough answer. I really wish I could say go here and you'll find everything. The Creative Commons is the website that I mentioned before. Um, I mentioned that one because that's the one that we, I have had the best success with in terms of using um, photos that are copyright free or copyright abled. Um, if you do decide to use another photo, so for example, the picnic bag skit example, let's say you go to a website and you find it, you may be able to purchase that photo. Um, and if you do purchase it, that's fine. The biggest thing is that you have to give credit to that, to whoever took the photo. Um, and so I, I really, I wish I could give you a better answer as far as like how to find better pictures, as far as um, in your specific example of like, we wanted a happy holidays thing. Um, and Michelle, you're raising your hand. I can see you raising your hand. Um, but it's, it, it is very, very tough to do. And so um, if you do have questions about it, please, please let us know. Um, th the biggest thing that I want to stress is the eliminating of just Googling for photos. Um, I think that it's been a practice for, for people. I know I've been guilty of it in the past as well. Everybody has probably done it at some point, but um, there have in, in real life, not trying to blow smoke or anything, there have been people at the university who have been, there have been fines issued um, for people using photos that they don't have permission to. Um, and so that has happened recently and it has happened multiple times. So I think that that's the big emphasis for me out of this is please don't steal the photos. And if you are going to steal the photos, make sure you give, or not steal the photos. If you're going to use the photos, please make sure you give the credit to whoever took the photo. I, I was I was going to continue to talk about Irina's question. If you're, you know, since registration is largely online, there's not going to be a, you know, maybe a, a photo in Widen that you're, that, that will go directly with that type of registration. But there are a lot of photos about classes you know, a lot of um, student, you know, kind of students working together type photos. So if you, you know, if you, if you broaden your, your search a little bit away from maybe, you know, registration and, and think more about the intent of the photo that you want for social, maybe that will help too. Yeah, it, it's tough and I, I, I'm more than happy to lend a hand however I can with it, but, um, but yeah, it, it is, it's, it's tricky to navigate, but that's also great because we do have widen available. And so um, with the widen collective, it's, it's, it's a, whenever I know that whenever I need a photo to use on a page, the widen collective is always the first place I go to, to look. So, But. I think there's another question up higher that we didn't answer yet. The can free can free photos be used for TV kiosks in our buildings, or do they need credit since it's only being used in house? I'm not sure if free means like Googled images, or free means like images they find on Widen. 
Yeah, and I'm I'm not exactly sure how I'm not exactly sure the answer to that. That would be something that I would have to do some looking and research myself on. Um because it's not on the web technically, but it is public. So yeah, that would be something that I would have to look up and provide some more. I don't I don't have an answer to that at the moment, but it is something that I can definitely take a look at and research. I think that um, if it's coming from Wyden and it's putting being put on a kiosk, I don't think it necessarily has to be credited because it's, you know, we shot it and it's being used internally. Um, but yeah, I don't know the answer if it's, if it's like free Googled images. Yep. Same here. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Well, cool. Well, um, at this time, I think probably good time to wrap it up. Um, I, again, um, be on the lookout for some emails that will answer all your questions. It'll have um, a copy of this presentation and all sorts of helpful links afterwards. So um, thank you all for attending this. This has been um, a great turnout. So um, Thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. So again, if you have any questions or comments, concerns, be on the lookout for your email for some more follow-up. And otherwise, just reach out to one of us and we can um, help you out in any way we can. Stay warm. It's cold out there. <laughs> <laughs>